daydreaming, that blissful mental state where we're not asleep but not fully conscious. It's a wonderful mental state, something that we all do as children, where our ideas and thoughts meet and greet and our imagination roams free. We do it all as children, but sadly less so as adults. And that's a real shame, because today I want to tell you that daydreaming is not just important, but a necessary part for a healthy and creative mind. Now I'm a mathematician, so it might seem really strange for me to talk to you about daydreaming. Because after all, us mathematicians are just meant to be human calculators. Be able to multiply seven digit numbers in our head at a split second and remember pi to 450 decimal places. Unfortunately, I can't do any of that. And as talented as many of my mathematical colleagues are, as formidable as they are, they can't do it either. And in fact, it's not unusual for mathematicians to be really horrible at arithmetic. Indeed, you should try and see us try to split a bill at a restaurant at the end of an evening. A bunch of mathematicians trying to work out how much everyone pays. It's carnage. So, why have I chosen to speak to you today about daydreaming? Well, I was recently at my parents' home on the central coast of New South Wales, and I stumbled across my old primary school report cards. And not remembering too much about my primary school days, except that they were a happy time, I was curious to read what my teachers said about me. And when I read them, I was quite surprised. A theme emerged. They said I was off task due to daydreaming. I'm going to be brave and share a few of these report cards with you right now. Here's my year four report card. The grades in mathematics aren't great, B's and C's, but here's the incriminating phrase, off task due to daydreaming. Here's another one. Again, grades, not that fantastic in mathematics, appears to be in another world. <laughs> and when I read these report cards, a flood of ideas and memories came back to me. Yes, I was daydreaming, but not daydreaming in the pejorative sense you might get from these school reports. I remembered thinking, thinking to myself, why on earth are the rings of Saturn formed the way they are? How could it possibly be that Jupiter, a planet made out of gas, was heavier than the Earth, where the Earth has rocks and ice and trees and all heavier stuff? Could you fly through Jupiter without ever landing? And actually come to think of it, why do you need a rocket to go to Jupiter? Why can't you just go there in a plane? So these were all of the thoughts and ideas and questions roaming through my little childlike mind. I wasn't just dreaming about being Batman. Though I did have those daydreams too, and they were very cool. I want to share one more primary school report card with you. Again, here's from year two. Grades, not that great. Incriminating phrases are there. Daydreamer, very much a daydreamer. But there's this last phrase that I read that I was really thrilled to see. But the class has enjoyed his imaginative ideas. And I was so thrilled to read that phrase because my primary school teacher in that report card has expressed what modern neuroscience is increasingly telling us about daydreaming. That it's not just idle reverie, not just indolent time wasting, but a necessary and important part of a healthy and creative mind. In fact, the science behind modern daydreaming is really fascinating. There's research that suggests that our daydreams are self-generated. That is, the stimulus for them are our brains themselves and not our immediate surroundings. That is, they happen despite our surroundings and often not because of them. They reveal to us our inner creativity. They're our little conduit to our inner creative engine room that's always bubbling away with our thoughts and experiences. And in fact, the part of the brain that is responsible for keeping us focused on a particular task, we're told is part of that same network that that is responsible for our daydreams or where our daydreams originate. That's quite often why we find ourselves drifting off when what's going on around us is less interesting than what's going on in our subconscious. So with that in mind, I hope none of you are daydreaming now. <laughs> but if you are, that's okay too. Because a daydreaming mind is a mind at its most creative. It's where all of our thoughts, our experiences, our memories, our questions, our anticipations meet and greet and dance. 
and true understanding about our world really develops. Now, as a research mathematician, a huge part of my job is to daydream, to find connections between two things, two seemingly different things that are actually the same thing. That's what our daydreams do for us. And funnily enough, an undergraduate professor, or when I was an undergraduate in Sydney, a professor described mathematics to me as the art of giving the same thing a different name or different things the same name. That was such a profound description of mathematics that has, that has stuck with me to this day. So with that description of mathematics in mind, I want to invite you to, to look at a little problem, a little easy problem in mathematics that we'll view from a few different ways. So here it is. How many ways can we arrange three points on a line? Well, here's how we'd answer it back at school. We'd probably do something like this. I'll put all these points in boxes. So I've got three choices for the first box. I could put A, B, and C in that first box. Then I've got two choices for the second box. And then I've got one choice for the third box. And if we multiply all those possibilities together, we get the answer six. OK, fine. Easy problem. Now I want to invite you to think about this problem in a slightly different way. I want to think about these three points, and I want to use strings like this. In other words, I'm going to permute the points on a line and just keep track of where they're going. So in this particular example, A will go to B. This is reading from top to bottom. B will go to C, and C will go back to A. Here's another diagram. A goes to B, B goes back to A, and C just goes to itself. It just stays where it is. And finally, a diagram, a really easy diagram, but a really important one. We just look at the three points and we do nothing. So A goes to itself, B goes to itself, and C goes to itself. And let me call these three diagrams R, S, and 1. And maybe you'll see why I call it 1 in a moment. Now, what I want to do with these diagrams is now do some algebra, some high school algebra, our x's and y's and our x squareds. And I want to compute things like R squared, S squared, RS, and SR squared. How do we do that? Remember, these are diagrams, they're not numbers. So let's start. What is R squared? Well, what I'll do is I'll stack the diagrams on top of one another. There's R, and I'll do R again. And I'll do some process that multiplies those two diagrams together to give me R squared. Here's what I do. I take those middle dots, and I just remove them, and just keep track of where the strings go. So after I've done that, here's what I get. So for instance, the green dot on the very top left, the string goes all the way through down to the bottom dot, orange dot in the bottom right. Remove those middle dots, and there's a new diagram that I didn't have before. And that's what I'll call R squared. Similarly, I can compute R cubed. I know what R squared is. I'll stack that on top of R. Do the same thing, remove those middle dots, keep track of where the strings go, and then you'll see that the string at the very top goes to its corresponding point on the very bottom. In other words, R cubed is the same diagram as the diagram one that I had before. I get that diagram back again. Similarly, I can compute S squared. I can show where squared is going to be one, just keep track of where those strings go, remove the middle dots, and I get the string one again. So I've got these two equations, R cubed and S squared is equal to one. Now I want to ask myself, what about RS? Here it is, let's calculate RS. The two diagrams there, stack one on top of another, remove the middle boxes, I get this diagram. Again, it's a new diagram that I hadn't got before. What about SR squared? S on top of R squared, remove the middle dots, then I get this same diagram again. And this is the thing I want to point out to you, that two different multiplications give me the same diagram. So we've got this little equation, RS is equal to SR squared. Remember, these things aren't numbers. If they were, then R times S is always equal to S times R. But not with these diagrams. We get a new different kind of algebra. And just summarizing, I'm going to get these, what I'm going to call equations of symmetry. That R cubed and S squared are both equal to 1. That RS is equal to SR squared. And the reason why I've called them equations of symmetry is for this following reason. Now let's think about a triangle. Think about all the symmetries of the triangle. I can rotate it, or I can reflect it. 
So two going to three and one staying where it is. And it turns out that if I think about all the symmetries of this triangle, that's the same as all the symmetries that I just got from these diagrams. In fact, these symmetries have a life of their own. I can write them like this in what's called a presentation. This is called a symmetric group of degree three. It's a, it's a way of, of abstracting symmetry and computing with it. It allows us to say things like the triangle up to symmetry is the same as three points in space. In other words, I've given different things the same name. And this is what we do all the time in mathematics. Now, I've just given you a little crash course in this area called group theory by this diagrammatic algebra. And group theory is the place where symmetry naturally lives. And it has many, many applications. It's a beautiful part of pure mathematics in its own right, but it has applications in molecular chemistry, high energy physics, computer science, our crypto systems. It's behind a lot of the algorithms that keep our passwords safe, that allow us to transmit messages securely. It's also used in internet speed up searches. So it's, it's everywhere. Now, if I just vary these diagrams slightly, I get some more complicated equations. If I cared about, for instance, whether a string was going over one or underneath one, I get a different set of equations. If I cared about where the strings were going, what directions they were going, I'd get a different set of equations more complicated again. And in fact, what these diagrams really do for us is that they're a shorthand for expressing equations that would take us pages to write out. Now, we're in December. We all should be doing our Christmas shopping. And unfortunately, I haven't. And a few years ago, I was in exactly the same situation, leaving my shopping too late. But I had a problem in my mind that I just couldn't solve involving these diagrams. And I decided to take a break in this busy shopping center. I got out my notebook, which I always have as a mathematician, my colored pens, and I started doing these scribblings with these diagrams to try and work out what was going on in my problem. And I got so engrossed in the problem that I just forgot my surroundings. Daniel Kahneman, in his book, Thinking Fast and Slow, calls that a state of flow. You're doing something really effortful, but it doesn't feel effortful. Time is just slipping by. You forget that you're breathing. You forget that, that you need water, that you need, to, you need to eat occasionally. And I must have been doing this for about an hour or so. And when I finally reacquainted myself with my surroundings, I noticed a little toddler, a little girl sitting next to me. And she had her colored crayons out and was doing all sorts of scribblings and all sorts of things. And we shared this lovely, beautiful moment where I looked at her diagrams and looked at her. She looked at my diagrams and looked at me and had that understanding that we were doing the same thing. <laughs> she turned to her dad and said, he's doing the same thing I'm doing, daddy. And the dad looked at my diagrams and looked at me and thought, it gave me the impression that I should be doing something more age appropriate. <laughs> and I didn't have the courage to say, well, actually, I'm doing something really complicated. <laughs> but I do like to remember that story because it reminds me and anyone involved in a creative endeavor, sciences, mathematics, art, poetry, sculpture, will understand this point too. The reason why we do what we do is because it allows us to explore the world with a childlike heart, and an insatiable childlike curiosity, and most importantly, a childlike mind that allows itself to daydream. Now in history, daydreamers and daydreaming have shaped human history and for the better. There are countless examples. I'll stay with mathematics and physics for the moment, but the, the most famous example is, of course, Einstein. He was reported to be a serial daydreamer. And also, he told us himself that he imagined what it was like to run next to a beam of light at the speed of light and what the consequences of that would be. Now, he may not have been dreaming that he was Batman or Superman, but he was dreaming that he had super-like powers in order to run that fast. But from that crazy idea, he comes up with an even crazier conclusion a correct conclusion that time actually slows down just from that daydream and from that he goes on to develop general relativity and not just that he develops many other theorems in a topic that we'll call differential geometry in pure mathematics right, really important Isaac Newton another one the apple falling from the tree pondering on that developing his theory of gravity this is just in the mathematical sciences or in physics but there are countless other examples in many other fields. So daydreamers have shaped our history 
and there's every reason to think that they will do so in the future as well. Now, I can hear the objections from all of us that we don't have time to daydream, we're too busy. Society has geared us, has geared us to saying that we don't have time for any of this. I've got meetings all day, I've got to get the groceries, I've got a dentist appointment at 9.30 tomorrow and I've got a string of other meetings as well. I just don't have the time. And I'm one of these people as well who bemoans the lack of time. But there are two important things that we must remember here. That daydreaming happens naturally. Our minds do it without being commanded to. All we need to do is take a little bit of time to see what they tell us. And secondly, on the shortness of time, we have to remember what Seneca said 2,000 years ago that a life is plenty long enough if we know how to use it wisely. That the problem is not that life is short, but alas, we waste so much time of it. That's a profound, that's a profound thought. So we all daydream, we have the time to do it. My final point is that it is necessary for us to daydream, necessary for our future prosperity. For think about the challenges that humanity is facing, most particularly from climate change. Think about all the correlative responsibilities that we have as a species to us and to our neighbouring species. Think about how at this very moment, the consequences of climate change are erupting into our political systems, our social systems and our economic arrangements. How are we going to meet these challenges? These systems need to be robust enough, yet compassionate in equal measure to meet these challenges. We're going to need some radically ingenuitive and creative ideas to find solutions to these challenges. And where are they going to come from? Well, I believe they will come from allowing ourselves, collectively and individually, the time and space to daydream. The time and space to wander through the labyrinth that these challenges pose in order that we might find some systematic, creative solutions to these problems. So, the next time you find yourself drifting off into a daydream, as long as you're not operating any heavy machinery, please go with it and see where it takes you. You might just stumble across, you might just start to formulate the next idea that can change human history and for the better. Thank you very much. <laughs>